Welcome to The Chat. This is a podcast from the team at Glasgow City Mission, the first and the granddaddy of the global city mission movement. I'm Charles Miles, proud to be CEO at this time. This series is intended as a resource and a point of connection for anybody interested in the work that goes on at Glasgow City Mission. I want to speak to people whose passion, vocation, career, faith journey or life aligns with an aspect of the work and the rhythm of what we do. Many will have a faith perspective, some will not. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Please check out our website and our social media platforms. Click like, subscribe to our YouTube channel and add us to your favourites. Feedback is welcome, but please keep it clean, keep it civil. Thank you. Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, this is a, this is the first uh, first one of these recordings. So anybody that's going to listen to this, um, if anybody listens to this going forward or in the future, um, if it lacks a certain pace, um, a certain measured uh, delivery, then that's because I don't know really what I'm doing. And uh, this is the first time, second time we've had a conversation, but the first time we've tried to do anything like this. So hopefully they'll be gracious and kind and forgive us. But would you introduce yourself for me, please, if you wouldn't mind, Peter? Uh, yep. Hi, Charles. Uh, it's lovely to be here and it's great to be part of a city mission conversation. My name is Peter Gardner. Um, I'm employed as a minister by the Church of Scotland, as a pioneer minister uh, to serve Glasgow's visual arts communities. Um, I've been a parish minister for over 30 years, served in um, rural Midlothian and uh, city centre of Glasgow. So uh, I know the environs of the city mission very well. And I probably know quite a lot of your clientele um, and uh, some of them are just wonderful people. But it's, it's lovely to be here. Lovely to be here with you. Looking forward to our chat. Well, I appreciate it very much. So the reason that we we're, were put in touch with one another um, is because, well, firstly, I should say that the whole point of doing these recordings, of doing these conversations is that we at the City Mission have a ministry which touches on a, a very great number of, uh, of arenas of life. Um, and one of those things that we do, one of the things that is really very popular at the mission is the work we do with art. We've got a wonderful art setup. We've got um, some, some good uh, equipment there. We've even got a pottery kiln, which doesn't get used as much as you might think, or actually you may know that pottery kilns don't get used as much. But if people want to throw down, they can throw down. And it's not jujitsu, it's, it's pottery. Um, but art is a feature of, of work, a feature of um, the help that we, we provide. And it's a source of really some great immersive practice from people. Uh, I think it's a source of um, mm. therapy for some people. In worship, if we go that way with people, it is sometimes a source of expression, of prayer, um, of access to something that they may not have words for. So art is mm. a special part uh, of what we do at the mission. And um, as a minister then, uh, a Christian minister who knows the city centre, who knows Glasgow City Mission well, and is now a professional artist. And we should say, I think I'm right in saying, with your wife as well, right? You're yeah. a partnership, Gardner and Gardner. Yeah, yeah. We run an arts practice, uh, work out of a studio in the Brigate in the East End of Glasgow City Centre, and we have an arts practice that we have developed over. Uh, goes into the mists of memory, but really got going in the early 2000s when uh, uh, I was minister of a church in central Glasgow which had a beautiful space to work in and it was just asking for some sort of uh, intervention we call them or installation work. So we started to explore what visual art, physical material visual art would be in the context of worship and it was about five seven years in when uh, um, a well-known curator was involved in one of the projects that used the building came and said to me um wow you've got an arts practice it's it's, uh, it's a really good it's uh, creating inst site-specific installation art in the context of sacred spaces and worship and it was the first time i had actually heard that particular 
dedicated 20 years in our ministry of um, creating art that uh, allows some sort of conversation to happen through it and around it um, about what is more than meets the eye. Um, Amazing. Um, maybe it's a bit like it's just uh, what we express. We kind of feel the art's a gift. Uh, the ideas are given to us and we just work work with them and give them away. It's all about grace. Something's given, something you give away. So it ties in with the city mission very well. Yeah, it does. Um, there's, a, there's a lovely thing about, yeah, there's a lovely thing when you're making a piece. And, um, I remember making a piece in Mary Hill Church, uh, out at the Church of Scotland Church. Um, and it was a piece for over Easter. So it was two halves of a piece. There was a, um, uh, it's called Carried and Opened. Uh, we created a wall of suitcases with a shadow gap cross in it for uh, Good Friday. And uh, so it kind of blocked part of the, the church out and blocked specifically a lovely um, kind of brick glass cross at the front of the church, blocked that out. And we turned it around and good. Uh, and, and sent the Holy Saturday up. And we took all the packing paper that we blocked the lights out with, and we built a huge, um, a huge stone out of packing paper. And there was one point when we were making this, and it's a very fragile thing, and to glue and bind it, and sort it together. And as we were moving moment of feeling at one with the Creator, not because I was doing anything special or particular, I was just rolling up paper and bunching it together, but the spirit descends upon the creative spirit who hovered over the earth, I think often meets us when we're being creative and utterly absorbed in it. And uh, that's deeper than words. Um, theology has to describe it and faith has to experience it. And it's deeper than words. And I think that's what works so well with people for whom words are a difficulty Mm -hmm. and a problem um, who've never found a way to articulate what's in their heart or to express what they think or are good at saying what they feel and sometimes things come out that they would never want to come out and regret later but art allows that to happen and god i think is in there um engaging with us so that, that amazing experience is an for me an affirmation of how often um God is in the creative place um, and you know, the city missions, uh, art space and engagement with its, its clientele and friends through the use of art ties in with that. It's really important. It is. Which churches more often would see art as a direct way of engaging rather than a tool to do something with other people or do something with children. But, uh, Direct way okay. of understanding the experience of the creator who's our father. So there's, a, there's a few things that jump out to me when you say all these wonderful things, and they they're quite deep things. So we could mine them for days. Um, I know. I'm, I know. Yeah. Um, but one of the things is is let, let's say when you're describing the pieces of paper that become the rock, and that you're in, you're immersed in this um, this 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 endeavor. There's an artistic endeavor that be, that that goes beyond artistic. It becomes something that chimes. Um, and and strikes the right chord with your whole being so you feel that you're one with your call i suppose um and then it becomes deep mm. deep like a prayer but a prayer that words can't be found to capture and how intentional yeah. is that for you and how accessible is that feeling do you think for an uninitiated person who thinks that art is just about being a good draftsman or drawing something that looks lifelike do you know what I mean? How is that going to be for somebody who's less intentionally an artist, but is maybe awakening to the arts within themselves? I think it's something to do with um, holistic self-giving. Um, if uh, the giving of ourselves in entirety uh, to any vocational work, Always, artists is one of the many vocations, uh, but um, I think for me it was a lot to do with just giving myself wholeheartedly to something and offering up as a gift. 
Mm. Um, and I think that's the heart of what we do. If you, all good things come from God. If we take that sentence from James to heart, um, and uh, and if we're doing something that is genuinely offered out of the goodness of our heart um, and received out of God's grace, or received sometimes when we don't know where, mm. I think that's that somewhere in there. Um, I don't think it's a methodology you can achieve because I think sometimes when you're working really hard to make something and to, um, I remember talking to a businessman one time who um, um, saying, Peter, I don't know why you always go for the 100%, you know, in business terms, 95% is kind of pretty good success, but I know it's in that extra 5% that really something gracious happens. Uh -huh. It's that sacrificial giving of self. And um, I work alongside artists who, uh, who are not of faith, um, but gives that extra 5% all the time to great personal cost. Um, and they see they find something there. Um, it's my role, I think, as a pioneer minister and artist to explore what that something is. And for me, uh, I can identify that's God's spirit at work, engaging with me. Um, and how do I help other people find that explanation or that understanding of what's going on? Um, you can't make it happen. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But sometimes it's just given as you give yourself wholeheartedly. Yes. So it's a long I, way of saying that very short thing. No, um, well, it's okay because it's like we said, like I said, it's it's so deep that you could mine it for, for days and forever. I think there's probably reams of self-help books that are trying to elucidate that very uh, narrow point, which is about um, a person who is yielded of themselves wholly to their vocation and call. And then through, to borrow the phrase, the practicing of the presence, they're able to then discern the spirit when it moves upon them. But that is something that's hard earned. And indeed, like you say, they may be people of faith and maybe people of none. But for those people that are true artists, truly living by their vocation, they have that hallmark of something of that, that the extra 5%, that's where the, that's where the magic happens to coin the phrase that that's really where the, I, could draw, the... I could draw a comparison um a comparison would be to be um a few years ago i think i talked before i walked to camino de santiago the pilgrimage route um and something ha amazing happens as you walk 500 miles and you're part of a community stretched over 500 miles it's quite amazing uh, and it's a deeply uh, godly experience um but not everyone who's walking on the path uh, understands it in the same way. So I've got a list in my journal of the way people describe their experience. Some people would say it, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. Some people would say it was St. James. And I, I've got these notes saying, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. So it feels like as a pilgrim, something deep is happening to everyone. And I can... I, Oh. I guess in some ways I've sought the spirit so often, I've sought God so often, I kind of have a rough idea, mm -hmm. uh, a totally imperfect idea of when I, when I notice the spirits at work. But you know, yeah, just, well, that's the spirit, that's the spirit. Um, but people don't know that's what's happening. Um, they often talk about, in pioneer ministry, we talk about rewilding the spirit. Um, so that as if somehow we've reduced and domesticated the Holy Spirit a little bit in our traditions. Um, whereas the Spirit is free, moves like the wind. Mm. Sometimes you notice the trees are moving. Oh, oh, it's the Spirit. Yeah. In front of a work and feel your, um, something touching you as you um, kind of art theory bit part of it. Would be something like we imagine in um, a work of art, the viewer and the artist encounter one another through the piece. But I think quite often I notice that 
it's not just the artist that is encountering the viewer, because the viewer is bringing their whole self to look at this thing, this something in front of them. Um, God's already speaking to them, and God uses all kinds of things to mm -hmm. speak to our hearts and souls. Um, so yeah, uh, looking at a work of art, making a work of art, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. God is still speaking away inside our souls, inside our hearts. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel bound to press in on this idea that how does one who is a practiced, you're a practiced in prayer, you're practiced in the art of yielding yourself to your creator and the lordship of Christ and, and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. There, there's a practice that comes from just being at this for a long time. And then a language becomes available to you to express it and to try and understand what you're feeling and going through every day. But if you imagine yourself in the position of somebody who's walked into the, your, your former church up at uh, Renfield St. Vincent, is that right, wasn't it? And, uh, or, or into I called Renfield St. Stephen's, yeah. 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 Or, or at Glasgow City Mission, and they've come in in chaos. And that chaos is just trying to find a voice, let alone discern all of these very profound and liminal things where mm. they almost touch uh the, the the hem of the garment of, of the lord and, and really experience something truly transcendental that they get and understand as that how do you coach or guide a person who's just at the beginning of that when they stand in front of a picture it may arouse deep things but they are deep things that um have no words um too deep mm. and uh but and they may be uncomfortable but how do they how do you how do you encourage somebody to stay in that pocket to stay in that space to say no this could be this could really work for you this could be a place where you find your voice this is this could be a place where you grow to understand who you are your journey where you've come from to explore the the difficult bits that you tend to look away from how, how would mm. you advise that to I, take place because that's tough i think the first thing is that it is tough and it's a by grace of God it happens uh, and um, for me I think the first thing is the space that anyone is in they have to feel completely safe mm -hmm. going into that deep place within you can be really disturbing and um, because it's so disturbing a lot of us run away from it <clears throat> I run away from it sometimes you know I'm sitting in front of a a piece of making and I can't face. You know. And I talk to artists, I discover sometimes a studio is the place they describe the studio is the place I don't go to. Because yeah. they know that's the place where they're going to get deep and it's challenging. But it has to, it has to be a safe place. That's the first thing. Someone's got to feel completely safe. Um, so how, how, some, how an organization or a church or individuals host a space has to be aimed at the people who come in through a door so they can feel safe. No matter what they feel, it's okay. And you're right. I think most of us are pretty chaotic inside. Very few of us, if any of us, have this life sorted. Um, there's moments in chaos in all of our lives. Um, so I think a safe place. Um, the second thing I think is people need to know that they can be heard. Um, especially when people feel inarticulate mm. and it can take a long time for people to find what they're actually saying is heard. And we had a project running in Renfield St. Stephen's. It's now called Andrews West, so it feels a bit of an oh, is it? archaic term mm. to call it. Oh, it's changed its name. Didn't, uh, it's I wasn't aware of it. Different... No, no, it, it's after my time. I'm just, I'm just being respectful of these lovely people. Mm. Um, uh, you know, there was a time when um, the, the door opened and the art project working and the Peacemakers Project, it was called, and we invited people to come and um, knit on a seminar website. People want to go there and, and look at them. Um, and we would spend sometimes hours walking around this room with people, listening to them. Um, sometimes in silence and then sometimes 
they would speak. And sometimes they would talk in the whole of the conversation that was most important. Um, but it was the making that allowed them to flow out of themselves. Yeah. So as they worked their way around the room and the, the will gradually became part of a bigger thing that they, what they were doing with their hands, it was so easy, their mind could relax. And so they felt safe and they were safe. Uh, and they could tell us over, and we would pray with people if it was appropriate. Um, we'd offer to pray for them and with them. And sometimes you could just hear God speaking to them through their own words. And that was the most wonderful privilege. And I think that started me along this idea that um, God is in conversation with everyone all the time. Yeah. And the most we can hope to do is to encourage it. And sometimes we're privileged to be part of it. And art's a way of allowing people, I think, to engage in that conversation when the words are so hard, they can't be found, but it keeps us there at the place of conversation. Yeah. Um, so we don't walk away, but the, um, it's a kind of, it's kind of um, theology of making, or as we make, these ideas gradually come to us, little thoughts come to us, but we can do so slowly. Whereas if we're talking, they have to come very quickly or we go on to something else. Yes, I find that- Maybe it's a bit slowing down. I, I think challenge. that's right. And yeah. I think I, I identify with what you've just said there with um, crafting sermons, if you, if, you, if you do so, if you, if you really address the text in a, in a way that I should do, of course, we all know that we don't always have the time in the week to do that very deep exegetical exercise, etc., and then really dig in to the text. Um, but when one does have that time to do that, um, a really a good sermon can be like hewn out of rock almost, like nothing's coming, nothing's coming. But then there's a thread, and then you, you just play with that thread for a bit, and then ideas start to come, and it sort of births itself yeah. uh, in a way it's um it's as though you just have to be patient and trust that in the process you, that something is birthed but also you are made new in it in a sense because you develop new ways of seeing new ways of uh, interpreting new ways of presenting uh, ancient things ancient truths uh, and, and things that have been poured over over millennium and i can hear something of that in what you're saying about art for yeah, this person for the, sorry to continue but for the person that comes in then to to an artistic endeavor or, or maybe accidentally just some color pencils and a piece of paper but they find themselves drawn to look into the place that needs healing or the dark recesses of a past that where, where forgiveness is required and that that may take them years um but it could just be that an artistic expression might just be the conduit to some transformational healing but not 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 birth without this struggle that we're talking about no i don't i, I think there's often a, a um, sense of identity that people have with um a piece of art and that kind of speaks to their imagination rather than their reasoning mm. uh, if these two things are separate i'm sure it's so interwoven it's hard to distinguish between the two um, but somehow I think um, both in looking at something or experiencing something and in the making, um, the imagination is where that works. And sometimes the, if we're open to it, it can take us into all sorts of depths of places um, that long for healing or long for help or long for expression. And that's a, it's a therapeutic part of it, yeah. but it's also a, it's deeply challenging. Very many people, um, and I think once you know, once you know for, it's happening, you need so much courage to stay in there. Yeah, and you need so much support around you. To yeah, say, it, it's okay to be there. It's and when these conversations are, uh, I use conversations, but I'm not meaning a conversation. These are inner processes are happening. You need people around you who can say, "It's okay. It's okay. We'll help you through this. We'll we'll stay with you through this." And it may take weeks, or it may take days. You may want to 
dig in today, then come back in three weeks' time and try again, and we'll, we'll be here for you. And I think that's a, a key part of it, is staying with people. Um, it's also very risky because what, if the conversation goes, <clears throat> or the um, people who are supporting don't find it easy. Yeah. Aren't equipped. Goes against what they think. Mm. Aren't equipped. Yeah. Mm. What do they do? Um, do they close the door and say, you're too difficult for us to deal with and uh. Uh, go have that conversation somewhere else? What, what do we do? And there's a big question, I think, particularly for those of us who have a, a church background who are not really equipped. I don't think we're very well equipped for a lot of the conversations that are happening out in the world at the moment. Um, and art is maybe one way of uh, allowing that conversation to be open so that we can say as much as we have no clue how to deal with this. We'll ask, we'll, 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 we'll explore what our, our, our books say, our sacred books say, we'll explore what our, our spirit says to us, we'll explore what God's doing, but maybe we don't know the answer to this yet. And art allows a question rather than feeling burdened to give every answer. Um, you know what it's like, you, you've worked as a, 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 a pastor over the years and so many questions, people want answers. Huh. Some of them we don't have. Yeah, some of them just, not fully, we have, a, we have an inkling. Yeah, there's a deep distrust, I think, in some um, more, <clears throat> I don't know what the word would be, more more inherited forms of evangelicalism there's a distrust of things like art um and sometimes the things of the aesthetic of beauty perhaps in the in a corrupting sense or because it's um because of the ambiguity that you live with the tension that you have to adopt this posture of actually i'm i'm content to live with the tension of this it's not resolved this is an anathema to a lot of our brothers and sisters in faith because everything is resolved you know and um they've got this very kind of structured um what, what's the word for it i can't remember it is a very linear way of thinking about how faith works it's like this 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 and this and this and the equation adds up to salvation and it's very definite yeah. but you you're learning you're say, saying to me i think that in art you've found a way through the formation that art has given you to become more comfortable with the not knowing with the not resolved things to be that, that you don't need everything to be neat and tidy for it to be okay no i think you're absolutely right i think when things aren't neat and tidy um there is a space for development and learning and creativity um uh, I think sometimes we're too quick to go from the spirit hovering over the chaos to the ordered days of creation. Yeah. I think we're sometimes too quick to jump that place. Yeah. Um, and God is present in both of those. Um, so neither one or other is better than the other, but both are in human experience. Um, yes, I think one is more realistic and more reflective of the... Um, the pattern and the scenes that we see in the the gospels of Jesus's walk with us, um, you know, not everything is resolved in, in those settings, yeah. even in the presence of the, the, the incarnate God. You know, um, yeah, we get the, uh, we get all these little short snippets of Jesus' scenes with someone. What, what happens to Bartimaeus after he follows him, or? Is there another conversation with the rich young man who turns away? Um, you know, we don't know. We just, we just, yeah. all these encounters. What happened to the Roman centurion whose servant was healed? Did he yeah. go back to wherever he came from? Yeah. What did he do? Yeah. But we only have these little moments, and there's so much unknown in, in the stories. And the temptation yeah. is to, is the temptation, of course, in our zeal would be to close off those um, little avenues by saying, well, of course, they, 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 they received the touch of the Lord, they realized who he was in his divinity, and they were therefore saved. End of story. Yeah. We, we kind yeah. of do our own thing, which is not there necessarily. 
Uh, and I agree lovely, with you. Yeah, it's that lovely thing at the end of Mark's gospel where it just stops. Yeah. Um, oh, no. As a neat thinker, it's a challenge. Um, but no, well, that's interesting. It is exciting. Yeah, it's, it's to go on. Something else happens. But this is the artistic time. mindset. You're content to play with the possibilities. Yeah, I think that's probably a lot of play, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. There's a lot of play, and you're not threatened by the potential for possibilities. Mm -hmm. And for sometimes making art is about, I think, looking at all the possibilities and you gradually narrow it down to something that's possible. So we make a lot of work in specific site, site specific um, installations. So quite often in a church space. Um, so we have to spend a lot of time sitting around in the space, just listening and seeing and feeling. We can spend hours in a place. I remember going to one church and we spent a whole day wandering around because we'd asked to make an installation and we just couldn't find the right thing to do. Yeah. And we spent all day. And so Heidi, my wife, said, OK, let's open every door and every cupboard and see if we can just anything. Because the actual church space just wasn't working at all. There was no, no in, well, there's lots of inspiration, but there's no ideas. It's too big. You have to cherry pickers and scaffolding and all these kind of things that make it unrealistic. And I'd opened this door into the uh, a stairwell, a vestibule that hadn't been used for 20 years. And the light in the space was just beautiful. And she just said, this is the space. This is the space. We created a piece called Vest Vestibule. And we phoned the minister and he came down and said, oh, I haven't opened that door for years. Huh. And so I had to kick open the rust and it opened out and it was right onto the main street. Um, and it was just this little amazing moment where um, we had to be content with waiting because the limitations were so huge and the possibilities gradually filtered away into there were no possibilities until we opened this door and suddenly there was one possibility. <laughs> um, but it's living with that, isn't it? It's, it's having the courage to live with that and the persistence to, to keep going with it. And the trust to know that if you press in and just try not to force a thing, the yeah. thing is there. That, you, Like yeah. you said before, yeah. God is not absent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. God is there. Um, I was reflecting uh, the other day on these verses in John, which talks about, unless you love your brother and sister, uh -huh. whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you haven't seen? And uh, kind of followed it a bit wider. And if you, if you aren't attentive to the world you can see around about you, it's really hard to be attentive to the creator who made it, yeah. um, who you can't see. Um, so a lot of work of training as an artist is learning to see mm -hmm. and learning to hear and, and just learn to soak up attentively the creation around you to find out what's, its, what's got its unique quality that you can work with. Um, yeah. But that, that takes up a lot of trying and a lot of mistakes. Yeah. You've got to be accepting. There's going to be a lot of mistakes in this, um, but it's, it's, it's a really exciting process. Um, so when you started drawing as a child, you'd have had a strong view of that's rubbish. Your mum or dad would have said, or whoever it is, would have said to you, oh, well, let me see what you've done. And you'd have said something like, oh, it, you, no, it's, it's, it's not very good. It's rubbish. Because it, it didn't meet with your mental picture of what you were going to translate onto that page. Or whatever. You, I'm sure you can identify with that because we've all been there, right? Totally, yeah. 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 Well, at what point then do you... Now, I'm going back to our guys and girls that sit at the table and they're just trying out mm -hmm. this thing and they're being given the courage and the, cons and the permission to just be brave and honest on the page and with no preconceived notions of what it should look like at anything at all content nothing mm. medium just go for it anything you want how do you grow into the person that trusts the form of the thing that you've brought to be how do you get to that place where you don't need it to look like x y or z person did it very difficult. It, it just takes a long time. You have to persist, I think. And mm -hmm. there's always a temptation to 
uh, run with other people, run with the, um, what they've done, what the person next to you is doing. Um, I think we can learn from other people's practice and what other people are doing. But it's always coming back to, okay, what, what's yours? Um, what is it that's... Do you know what that's really fascinating is, I think very rarely do any of us realise that we are uniquely gifted with a unique view of the world. Um, so I'll be working at something, searching for that extra something. And another artist will come and say to me, that's amazing what you've created, I love that. And I'll say, what is it? What's in it? Just you, you're in it. It's, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. uh, because I, you cannot see yourself in the work because it's the whole of you. Yeah. Uh, other people can. Uh, that's a gardener and gardener piece. Um, and they recognize it. I'm not sure I do recognize it. Um, start to recognize our style, but it's taken me a long time to look and say that, that is, and maybe that's the gift of uh, a good um, tutor, like a good pastor, like a good spiritual director. Uh, um, is um, I can say that, that's that's you you're doing that uh, this is taking this direction yeah. um, I, I uh, year 2000 I went off to Leith School of Art amazing art school Edinburgh brilliant place for anyone who wants to explore their practice loads of um, opportunities there they created a, a space for me for uh, three months uh, uh, I hadn't, hadn't painted for 25 30 years um, I hadn't painted since I was a child and they said to them, I want to come as a study of the proposal and I want to paint an Annunciation painting. And bless them, they took me on. Um, and um, the tutors there were just amazing. Uh, one Paul um, said to me, I think, I, think you'd be, I think you'd be happier working in layers rather than just straight colours. Um, so you go to, go to the old techniques, modern techniques to apply blocks of colour and then narrow it down, go to the old techniques, the 18th century techniques and layer it up. And I found my heart in there. Yeah. But it took somebody of that ability to give me a direction. So uh, it's really important, I think, that people who are tutors can actually watch and listen and see what someone's doing. I oh, obviously have a love for birds, go for there, that, oh. use that. And this medium is good for doing what you're doing or um, you're, you're looking at light and shadow you're not looking at color stay with stay, stay with monotone um, so tutors do that kind of thing the best tutors do that kind of thing yeah and there's there's people who combine that uh, skill uh, with a, a really deep care for the folk they're working with and yeah that's what happens at the city mission it's it's that well, similar <laughs> care with enabling you, people to you've just to described the very the Everest of, of, of the quality of, of what we would all want to believe that teachers would all bring a deep sense mm. of um, learnedness in their craft of, of the desire to impart and nurture talent to see it sail and, and really take off um, and really equip uh, people who are struggling to see the forest for the trees and say, well, just identify these trees for me and put you in the right direction. Um, these are in, you just described the most incredible that's a great advert in fact for Leith Art School I've forgotten that it even existed mm. to be honest with you in Glasgow it's all about Glasgow Art School right but uh, um, yeah <laughs> it's and a so, place. yeah so, place so, to, so, so, so to the hope that we and I'm sure they do because you know we've got a great team um, that are conversant with the language of art and painting and creativity and indeed, a lot of people see their faith as a very creative process and they've grown to see that. And that's good. Um, and it excites me to hear you say, oh, even 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 draw alongside having described Leith Art School like that. And then to say that's what you do at Glasgow City Mission, that that is uh, yeah. that, that's that would be the that's the that's the dream. I'm sure that we we are working and in every arena of what we do, we are working toward being that thing that you've just described. That's very exciting yeah. to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's... and that's what it should be, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And one thing is another thing to say about, about working our practice as artists is we, we <laughs> maybe it's a Scottish thing. I don't think it's just that 
but we own we, we focus on using um, materials that can be found lying around mm-hmm. or are are waste products that nobody even pays attention to. I, I can't describe as a kind of redemption for for things. So, uh, for example, we, we make, made a piece. Uh, like, uh, it was a uh, Easter piece uh, out of discarded teacups, broken teacups. That uh, you know they were once treasured, probably kept in a glass cabinet at one time, but by the time they came to us, they were neon orange. And uh, no, we just made them a dark black first of all. I beg your pardon, really heavy black and. We hung them, 40 of them, on a frame uh, for uh, Holy Week and Good Friday um, as a sense that this object is being repurposed. Yeah. And then on, the, on Easter Saturday, we got outside and inside them, so they were hung again. again and uh, it felt like this was a discarded object that cost us nothing. Um, and that's maybe the Scottish part of it. But uh, all these discarded objects that can be made into something valuable and beautiful, uh, kind of a metaphor for how we all work. Um, so we often use discarded objects. You don't have to use, um, you don't have to use paints or expensive materials to be creative. Um, you can use anything round about. Whatever you find can be made beautiful. That's my and, and coming to that place then, I think, goes back to my question to you as to how did you come to be the, to go from being the kid who says, no, mum, you can't see it, it's rubbish, um, because it didn't conform to your preconceived notions, to then being the person that has the courage to say, no, this, m- this medium, these cups, I, uh, something I found I'm sufficiently comfortable with my voice as an artist to 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 bring it bring whatever it is we're bringing through these cups that's a massive road that isn't it that that's got to be a long grind to get to that yeah. place um yeah it's taken many many years but that way um probably only started to make art in probably one of the most difficult uh environments for making art which is the church um because it's not it's a a word-based um it's a word-based community uh we focus on what we say what we sing what we hear what is said so making something visual is a challenge i do remember um an artist in one of my congregations making i'd asked him to make me a big apple for a harvest thanksgiving service Uh, at the time if i made a big apple i'd have probably made something a little bit like a a pumpkin. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have been anything like an apple, really. But Colin made me this Cox's Pippin, this three foot high Cox's Pippin, with this beautiful stalk coming out of it. Um, and and, and it, a piece was a, he made, I never asked him to do this, but uh, he made an apple pip inside it with some soil it could sit in. It was an exquisite thing. I almost felt I could have said anything in that service and people would not remember. What they remembered was there was this beautiful apple and isn't God amazing? Aren't apples beautiful? Yeah. Through the rest of the service. And there was something just wonderful about a sense of thanksgiving. And that kind of woke me that there's something really deep in here about how we experience and how how our visual experience affects the way we think and what it does to our our memory and experience of a moment. Experience of a moment and memory of that experience. Um, It transcends what we say about it. I want to find that again and again and explore what that is. And so rather than a sense that uh, this is my voice, it was more a sense of, I'm seeking, I'm following that thread. Where's that thread going next? Okay, uh-huh. let's look at cups, let's look at cups. Okay, what, what, where else can follow that thread and to keep going with that? Um, and it, it feels in some ways like a, in terms of 
the church, it's a specialist area. But at the moment I started to work among other artists, I realized, oh, here's a whole world of people who are following the threads. Yeah. Um, and it's been a wonderful part to be part of that community and enter into these hugely deep conversations uh, with artists who are trying to follow the thread and some of them are doing it at great cost. It's quite astonishing. Yeah, no doubt. Um, well, art, art, true art comes at a great cost, doesn't it, often? Yeah, I'm, in, I'm interested in the fact that um, your, um, what do we call it, the denomination, the, the Church of Scotland, have the vision and the and the desire to commit themselves to your appointment and post creation of this ministry um i think is um a remarkable quite a lovely and re remarkable thing um is tell us how that came to be if you don't mind four years ago the, the church scotland was ex what pioneer ministry is because of church and explore what is happening in the world and find a place and they, they set five of us going um four years ago uh, one in the farming communities one in strong students one an amazing one in paisley among the, the community in fergusley park um, and uh, another one in a, a new housing area in midlothian so there were five of us set off in different areas and the church was astonishingly generous and said well we'll support you for five years and we will report back on what you're finding and they created a structure for us to for support and structure for us to report back and uh, it really feels that we have stepped beyond the walls of the church into the world that most people live in and uh, there's so much we have learned that it, you know, it's hard to feed it all back at the same time and um, the people who were at the chapters of the farmer and farming community, he was a farmer, the Methodist minister who a, has his own farm and he's the perfect person. He can walk into a farm and discuss cows because he knows them mm. um, and he's got his own, his, his own herd. Um, so having a practice of an artist is really important because that's, that's my community and I feel at home in that community. Um, and it's been lovely to be made welcome. It's astonishingly the response we've had sometimes. Um, I remember being in one meeting and we were asked to say what our roles were and uh, what we were doing. And, uh, and there was about 20 artists and I said, um, and Peter Gardner had been employed by the Church of Scotland to be a minister to serve the visual arts community of Glasgow. And there was an intake of breath and a, a wow of appreciation that the church would do such a gen generous thing. Mm. Isn't, it, isn't it great to be part of a, a church that does a generous thing? Um, that's the feeling I have about uh, the way the world could see the church. And if we would invest beyond our borders um yeah to serve the world in which we live uh, and yet and guys do in city mission yeah well sure um but and i'm i'm thinking then about what you uh, um said a, a little a few minutes back about being a bit of an anomaly you didn't use that word but you know of being the visual artist in the church um is it's not the visual medium that really travels there it's the word and of course we the, the Jesus that we recognize is a man who painted pictures with words that would resonate with the common folks. Um, and of course, we both then would have a, an affection for the more ancient traditions, pre-Reformation uh, traditions, perhaps, um, in their use of the visual media um, regularly as a feature of worship um, and uh, access mm. to the higher things um in the liturgies or the stalls or, or whatever it is you're using everything has this yeah. artistic um resonance and uh, significance and there's nothing lazy about it everything's very very 
thought through over the course of the 1500 years or whatever it was that it came into being. Um, and, and now we have the Church of Scotland uh, positioning you in the community of artists. Yeah, well, the, the churches, I think all churches are trying hard to work out what it means to live in a world as, as visual. I mm. think of, of, it's, I mean, it's long accepted the way modern society communicates is visually. Um, and the church is having to catch up with that or translate into that. And I think is sometimes struggling, sometimes doing it well. And it is really challenging uh, yeah. to, to wait long enough. We, we talk about waiting long enough with the, we, we live with the verbal until it opens out into the visual. And sometimes that is a slow process. We just, um, I don't know, uh, an exhibition, we're invited to Glasgow University Chapel to create a, a piece uh, that reflected on the COVID times. And we, were, we made, made a piece out of, that grew out of Ecclesiastes chapter three, verses one to eight. Uh, there's a time and a season for every activity under heaven. And the point that really kind of caught into our, our thinking was, um, in May 2019, May 2019, when um, my wife's father died and that was read at his funeral. And we both said, we need to make a piece that explores this, 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 these uh, eight, cha eight verses in chapter three. And that was 18 months ago. So it could take a long time yeah. for a, to deliver the words so that it becomes, becomes visual. And I think that's the difficulty we have in the church and that we don't have the time mm. to wait for a long time for the words to become visual. And the more, I mean, if you happen to produce something to inspire and challenge and uplift people week after week, when do you have the time as a pastor, as a teacher, as a preacher, uh, to wait with the words until it opens in the visual? Yeah. So there's something about how we work as a community so that we can work with other people who have yeah. both the artistic skills and the time and the commitment yeah. to it to wait. There's, there's a remodeling needing to happen. It uh, makes me think of a few, work. a few threads there um, um, around the idea of visual culture now of the the need that we spoke about earlier to make things neat and finished with tidy ends and everything is very conclusive and linear and then you think and then i mentioned the the the, the sort of more historic church the the more ancient sort of roots and their attitude towards time must have been very different because they didn't they didn't appear to think twice about conceiving of a cathedral which would take 200 years to build. I mean, the, the very notion that a person would start on a building project that they knew their grandchildren may not live to see complete is an anathema yeah. completely Absolutely. to us in this gen generation, yeah. right? They must have had a very different view of what their place in the universe was, of what their expectations were in terms of time and expectation and the devotion and the, the fact that the devotion over the course of two centuries was perfectly sensible thing to do. Today, we, yeah. it's just impossible to conceive of that, isn't it? Uh, and also, they would make these incredible works of art, particularly stonemasons. Yeah. They make these astonishing sculptural pieces, and nobody knows who they are. No, anonymous. Yeah, you know, they they never they never signed. Maybe left some mason's mark in a corner of a, a building that one of that one of their friends would know, and that was more just a case of uh, letting somebody know yeah. that it was finished and it was signed <laughs> off by this nation. Mason. Yeah. And sometimes, and I remember being in Strasbourg Cathedral where Martin Busser at the heart of the Reformation was, um, and you've got the tour of the roof space, and there's all these incredible sculptures and carvings. No one can see. No, Only and that no didn't matter. See. Less ego, oh, less <sighs> much. Think, Much less. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, less ego, Focus less. wasn't on me. What is narcissism? Like the Greeks, oh. we left that with the Greeks. 
it, I'm just doing my job. <laughs> I'm learning my craft. That was it, yeah. And this is to the glory of God. This is just yeah. a, uh, this is the, the joy glory. of sculpture and the glory of God. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah the, the joy of tapping away at a bit of stone, yeah. which is quite infectious, I have to say. Um, no doubt. But at the same time, the same time, it's not about me. It's about the work. It's about what can happen in 200 years' time. Yeah. Wouldn't it be amazing if, if we could think of our engagement with uh, culture in those terms mm. of 100 years, 200 years? Yeah. Uh, what are we passing on? We're starting to think about that in terms of the way we treat the environment. You know, it's not about what we need, it's about what our children and their children might have. Yeah. Um, think about that in terms of culture also. Um, we, we, we are starting to think of it. Uh, I think, though, we're not yet able to think of our ecological um, aspirations are not yet divorced from the need for those people that are pioneering and pressing mm. for their own legacies. There's still there are still a lot of vain legacies in place. I think there are. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's, I un that's being unlike the Mason. Yeah. Unlike the Mason. Yeah. For every Mason or not, for every be 100 Masons, there is a stained glass window of a bishop holding a model of the church that they've created. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's someone remembered. <laughs> uh, so th th there's always been, I think, that um, kind of uh, challenge of where does memory sit? You know, you make a piece of art. All our art we make is temporary. That's the yeah. way, something to add into it. That, yeah. Um, we are, I, mean, I, I, have a, I have a strong sense of uh, our, say, our lives on earth are temporal. They're, they're, they're short lived. You know, yeah. we're here and today, like the flowers and gone tomorrow. Um, and that, that, that real anxiety of living with that sense of temporality, especially during the COVID times, has, has maybe come back much stronger to many people. Um, our art has always had that same practice. We make something we take it down it might take weeks to make it's there for a day some things were only up for a morning what and they, they took and they've gone <coughs> i've gone and there's how do you hold something you, how, how do you hold something that you've birthed uh so lightly as to be able to see it do, can you do the pulling down or do you have to let someone else do it no no it's, taking it down is part of the well, it takes hours to put up, takes two minutes to come down sometimes um, well, <laughs> because of the care you put up in it. It's actually a strange experience because um, quite often Heidi and I will make a piece and we'll finish it. Now, um, there's a perfectionist nature to the way we want to see things finished. It's got to be finished the way we want it to look yeah. like. And then as soon as it's finished, it feels like it's no longer out. Um, it's been given away. Um, um, and it belongs to, it doesn't belong to anyone. It, it's just there. It belongs, if anything, it belongs to the creator of all, all things. And people who come in and engage with it will do what they, it'll be part of it. They're already given away. Um, mm. And it's quite funny watching us, I think, when we finished the piece, if you, if you filmed us leaving the building after it was done, it's almost we turn our back on the piece we've just made. Yeah. We may love it intensely, but it's no longer ours, uh, and you have to you give it away. Um, and sometimes it's just a rearrangement of the objects in a space that makes it beautiful. Or intervening a couple of extra objects, you just got to give it away. Um, so that, it, that's that feels part of it. Is there not a temptation for you both to? like a sermon isn't it yeah well it is that it, because because as we i think we said before when we spoke before briefly um you, you it's a similarity you, yeah you get to the door to shake everybody's hand as they leave thank you for coming nice to see you and they'll say very nice sermon or hopefully they'll say very nice sermon <laughs> um i i really got this from it and you're like wow you know really i crafted that and honed that sentence that point that theological twist uh the, the hinge upon which the whole thing moved at it, it, and you got that wow and you don't say that of course but you're thinking about different people get 
what they needed or wanted from a thing it leaves you it becomes the property of the, the world i guess in the grand sense yeah. i don't mean it in a vain sense yeah. but you must have a desire to make something and like because there's that thing about leaving your mark leaving a legacy you know so it may have been enough for the trainee uh, mason to leave his work unseen but is part of the bigger whole and he knows that there's something of permanence there behind um with or without his name it doesn't matter he knows but do you not have this desire you you both to to create permanent fixtures no i actually i actually don't no i don't we, uh, we made one piece uh in lying side church it's the only piece we've made that's still up um because the church asked us could they keep it up it was it was made in response it was an advent piece and it was made in response to the um terrorist attack on the christmas park in berlin uh -huh. we'd been in berlin at the time and uh, uh the newspaper in berlin the next day amazingly in a secular city like berlin it's astonishing its entire front page had only the words in german do not be afraid. Astonishing. Mm. And for us, the, the, the important part was receiving that as a gift and then working our hardest to finish the piece and then walk away. Yeah. Having finished it, we've done what we've been asked to do with the gift we've been given. And it's fine to take it down. It's, it's been done. It's, it exists enough. Um, the congregation came back and said, can we keep it up? We, we really like it, can we keep it up? And it was a serious dilemma for us. Spent a good couple of months debating back and forward, should we do this? Is this? And talking to lots of artists about it. And some people said, well, it's your practice that's temporary, so it should always come down. And other mm -hmm. people were saying, well, you've got to give it away. And, and they're lovely people and they, they let them. They just said, yeah, it's just, just keep it up and, until it looks terrible. If it starts to fall apart, we'll take it down then. Yeah. It's only meant to be up for three weeks and uh, four weeks. Um, but yeah, that was a, a piece that it felt like the moment it's made and finished, it could walk away and mm. it's done. And that feels that what my responsibility is to, my responsibility is to, to finish it um, to the best of our ability. Um, I think Heidi often talks about the gift that's received, it's already given and she quite often will see a piece completed in her mind. Yeah. And it's to bring it to that place where what we've made is what she had seen and been given to her to see. Um, or then we'll process it. I've just got to try and work through the process till I get it the best I can. And I can walk away. Um, it doesn't feel unusual to do that. Yeah, well, no, <laughs> clearly to you. I, I find it very... Uh, I find it quite striking and I'm very <laughs> intrigued by by this uh, because I take, I'll give you an example. I've got, um, when my son was about four, I did a mural on his wall and stupidly, what I should have done is put up um, f hardboard panels to cover the wall if I thought I was going to care about it. Because then, of course, when he's older, I could have taken it down in, in its three pieces, say and um, giving it to my grandchildren or something. Not that they would want it, but you know, it's there. Um, <clears throat> as it is, I did it directly onto the wall. Now, this creates a problem because he is sentimentally attached to it, but he could he's 18, he could really do without three superheroes who are eight feet tall each, bursting out of his wall. Uh, and I could not bring myself, if anything, when I've got to paint over this thing, oh. it's gonna have to do, I'm gonna do the reverse. So I'm gonna put the hardboard panels up over it so that I know it's intact underneath. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's just that's just Bat that's Batman, Spider-Man, and Superman jumping out of a wall. You know, this is nothing. But I I just and we're what are we now? We're 14 years on from when I did it. There's no way I'm getting rid of it. I couldn't possibly bring myself to do it. So the fact that you do that is uh <laughs> my, blows my mind. <laughs> Um, what you, I started thinking about other other strategies. You could trace the whole thing, and then you've got the whole thing. I've been thinking about it. I've been thinking about high high def photography. Yeah. 
Oh, absolutely, yeah. Alternatively, you can think that this will be painted over and then in 50 years' time, 100 years' time, when they're doing some kind of archaeological examination of the yeah. house, they'll be pieces. What's this back masterpiece? Go, oh, <laughs> found, found an, this original, masterpiece. an original Could, Charlie Mars. These characters. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Did, did these people dress like that back then? Yeah, right. Uh, I can't imagine. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, maybe, maybe long, think long term. Yeah, yeah we'll, I'm time. like, I'm but suddenly. It's, it's I'm, strange, isn't it? In that sense. Yeah, it is strange. I'm in cathedral. I'm in cathedral mode now. I'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> generations ahead of me. But there, there is a joy, isn't there? Uh, but I remember, I remember when at least School of Art, one of the tutors, I uh, spent ages. Doing... <laughs> it was a hard lesson. This was a hard lesson at the time. It was a good one. You know, the, the teaching of art is often about what how what you see and trying to. The drawings you make are studies of what you're seeing. Um, Cartier-Bresson, the photographer, said something like, uh, um, when I photograph, um, I record, but when I draw and paint, I meditate on what I'm seeing. Uh -huh. And so you're, you're attentive, it's your drawing. So maybe I spend, spend a day doing a drawing. It wasn't any good at all as a work of art. And but I was invested in this drawing. And uh, it's all charcoal, so it was very, very fragile. And my teacher in the end, hey, good Peter, said, what do you think of that? And I'd critique it. And I, I, I just critiqued all the things that were wrong with it. And he, he agreed with me. He said, yeah, yeah, you're right. And he just <laughs> all over it, rubbed it out. Me a drawing. You'll do more than this. You'll do better than this. This is just a drawing. Everything is you learning. I thought, gosh, it's amazing. That yeah. is a lesson. Maybe there's part of that of just thinking what we've made is just ready for us to do the next thing. So we'll let on to do something else. Yeah. Um, there's also this thing, if you make art in churches, churches have a huge tendency, tendency to make things permanent that yeah. should be temporary. Yeah. So I can walk into a church and it's full of um, things that people have made that have lost their initial force. Yes. <clears throat> initial meaning. That's religion, though, isn't it? That's that's what happens. Yeah, that is what happens. So that there's a sense of which I'm aware of that um, of being a being in churches where some of the things I'm thinking that would have been lovely in its day. Mm. Um, I do remember being in one church where um, there, were, there was a, a resurrection series of banners. He is not here. He is risen. Yeah. Unfortunately, they lost. He is risen. And so all that was left was he is not here. And I was just like, please take it down. Yeah. But you, that's the artist in you <laughs> seeing so that. Because they knew the people had made it. And, sure. Yeah. And we, we all know so those banners. There's a sense in which time comes on. Yeah. There is. <laughs> So, oh, so beautiful, yeah. Yeah, well, no doubt. I mean, they are often the, the finest materials and, and the love and the effort that's gone into them. But in a way, then I'm hearing that your 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 view of an installation in an, in, a, in a church setting is is a counterpoint to that um, false permanence um, that this mm -hmm. is an intentionally temporary. Um, and and yeah. and as long as it exists, it causes you to feel or think or ask, and then it's done its job, and rightly then you move on to the next mm -hmm. thing. That feels like that's something of the conversation you're having in this with the spaces. I think it is. Yes, I, th I think it's also um, if a, a work of art can uh, installation can really dominate a space and can. Um, ask too much of people no people can respond really strongly to it that's maybe better to say it that way mm. um and they can respond against it this can i think one installation where i'd made along with the artist carl marples heidi and i had made uh, a, a piece called uh, weaving the word which was a huge huge 16 by 14 meter um weaving made out of deconstructed bibles um and it hung above people in a huge way. And one lady in the congregation, when we put it up in the church, 
felt oppressed by it. Mm. And was really, oh, you've been able to say to her, um, first of all, I'm glad you feel really strongly about it because it means it's, it's there's something in it that's speaking to you. Um, but also able to say it's going to be here for two weeks mm. and then it'll be gone. And so it's one of the liberating parts. The piece will be there for a time, but will be taken down. So if you have an exhibition in an art gallery, temporary exhibition, it will be there for a month, two months, three months, then gone. And the place will be completely redecorated for the next piece. So we, we often make the commitment in churches when a piece goes up, then it should come down and leave no trace of itself um, so that something else can come in. And people who, who were struggling with it, for whom it was too, um, too intense an experience. Too visceral. Oh. Their space was returned. Mm. It's too, too visceral that it can be returned. Mm. And folk who love it know they've had a period when it's there. Um, and as someone comes in to do an installation of a piece in a space where I've already made one, it's really intriguing that they always see something I have completely missed. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And they pull out of the space something that, oh, right, okay. Never thought of that. Yeah. But that's really good. That's marvelous. And starts to make me quality is a really important uh, part of the work. Um, maybe in our current climate, we need a bit more of the mission that we're temporal. Um, you know, flowers of the field, they flourish, they fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So, or in Ecclesiastes, it's uh, there's a time for everything under heaven but God has placed eternity in our hearts. Mm. Um, so there's that second part that allows me, I think, more freedom to be temporal, to be human, uh, rather than wanting to leave a, a mark. When you walk through a landscape, you leave a shadow in the land. Mm -hmm. but that shadow departs with you. Um, maybe that's the truth of all of us, that we find it hard to grasp. And to I think accept. that's right. I and, think people, uh, yeah, there's a loss of meaning. There's a there's a clamor for relevance and to have been significant in some way and uh it's it's very like we like we mentioned earlier now that would be it will be deep and i am not qualified to speak into that but it's very much uh, of our time and of our age probably of every age but only the exalted very few could have thought that they would ever leave any kind of mark whereas now everybody's trying to everybody's got their stamp on the world wide web or whatever mm. even this pot you know this mm. podcast is something that is a, a record i suppose for people to well, a reference piece no, mm -hmm. i've uh, i've got very bad signal easy, though. i remember i remember struggling with that oh yeah. ah I, yeah i keep losing you I'm, okay I'm, you're still okay with me oh good oh, no. Good. no it's okay you keep going if, I, if if you've got me that's good now I've got you loud and clear, Charlie. You're, you're coming across clear and, and the, vid, the, the vision's clear. It's not blocking at all. Maybe it's mine, but it's a problem. No, I doubt it. I doubt um, it. Well, I'm recording, so uh, I, I need to get here. Remember several years ago in 2013. Okay, okay. Have you got this? Is this back on again? Yeah. You go got with me. Go. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I was going to say, on that temporality, I remember reading. Um, I remember sitting at church, oh, you're back in a different format. So that has jumped quite a lot. Mm. Well, you know what I think, Peter? I think we should probably wind it up. Um, I think we've done plenty. Be because we've done around, a good yes. bit. And you know what? I think that we've got plenty that we could talk about another time. Because I, I, want to, I still want to know more Sounds about... Good. Yeah, I want to know more about how you, because this has prompted questions. Um, I'm thinking how your temporary installations can be in some way prophetic. I'm interested in what age you were when you thought you should go back to painting and drawing or whatever and art. And lots of things about your experience in Leaf and a lot of other things. So if you're okay with it, we'll call it a day today. And then we'll, we'll come back to it on another occasion. Okay.